So thank you all for your patience. Just wanted to make sure there wasn't some other problem. <laughs> no, um, all right. Well, thank you all for joining today. This is Brendan Jordan with the Great Plains Institute. And uh, thank you for attending today's webinar on capturing carbon in Nebraska. This is webinar number three in a series focused on geology uh, in Nebraska for supporting carbon capture. Um, Want to thank all of our co-hosts today. I won't I won't list them all off by name in the interest of time, but you can see them up on on slide here. Actually, am I sharing? Hold on one second. Not yet. Shoot. I'll I'll, I'll just continue to be our technical issue today. So our, our co-hosts today are Battelle, the Nebraska Conservation and Survey Division, Nebraska Ethanol Board, Nebraska Public Power District, the Regional Deployment Initiatives, and Renewable Fuels Nebraska. And hopefully at this point, you can see my slides. Oh, there we go. So as an overview of our meeting today, um, we'll first hear from Matt Jokel, uh, the Nebraska State Geologist with the Nebraska Conservation and Survey Division. We'll hear from Jared Hawkins with Patel and one of his colleagues. And we'll hear from Dan Blankenau with Great Plains Energy. And so I think at this point, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, and hand things over to, to Matt Jokel. Actually, we do, we do have Andrew Dugat on the line as well. And I um, believe he wanted to do a welcome from Patel. All right. Sorry, I was muted. There's nothing I can do to un unmute the, the button. Um, all right. So anyway, uh, so yeah, so I'm the, the PI for the integrated mid-continent uh, stacked carbon storage project in Nebraska and, and Kansas. And I just uh, wanted to thank everybody for, for being here to learn about storage potential in Nebraska. Um, so I don't have a lot more to say than that. The, the project has been going on for the bulk of the last four years. It's ending either next week or in the next couple months, depending on what final schedule gets negotiated with Department of Energy, but the learnings from the project and the, the potential for projects will continue into the future. So I hope everybody on can take away, um, can take away something here and, and in the future, if you need to reach out to people that were part of the project, I think there's slides at the end that will uh, make those contacts. So with that, I think you can go ahead and pass it to Matt. All right, thank you very much, Andrew. Well, um, Matt, jo Matt Jokel is the, the state geologist of Nebraska, director of the Conservation and Survey Division. Uh, and uh, he holds a PhD in geology from University of Iowa and has research interests in the areas of uh, bedrock strate uh, str uh, stratigraphy, sediment, I shouldn't have tried to actually read this, yeah, Matt, sedimentary yeah. geochemistry and a variety of other expertise he's been a part of the, the carbon safe project for multiple years and uh, has a lot of experience with these issues. Matt, I think you can take it away. All right, can everyone see my first slide? Yes. Yes, Matt, it looks great. Yeah. And, and everybody can hear me? Yes. Okay, great. It's a pleasure to be here today. I will try to keep my remarks to the allotted time that's something for which I am not known. So please forgive me if I go a few minutes over. I wanna give a very general geologic overview uh, for the purposes of today's webinar. Uh, big question is why? Now I was asked to offer some comments about the economic side of this in Nebraska. I'm not terribly qualified to do that. After all, I'm just a geologist, but I am a Nebraskan and a long-term Nebraskan in that. And I just wanna offer a little bit of context here. First of all, this is a statistic with which everyone should be familiar. We're still a little more than 80% dependent on fossil fuels in this country. During the time that I've kept an eye on that percent dependence, as calculated by the U.S. Energy uh, Information Administration, we've ranged between about 78 and 83 percent dependent on fossil fuels. 
So our use of fossil fuels won't be going away. I take it everything is fine on the audio and video still. Brendan, good. Uh, Nebraska needs energy and anything we can do to increase our access to energy is good. As of 2018, we ranked number seven in per capita energy consumption uh, and number 17 for energy consumption per dollar of real dollar of GDP. Even though we rank number 34 in energy production and number 36 in real GDP. We may rank relatively low in energy production, but energy production in Nebraska in the form of petroleum extraction does put money in people's pockets. And if we can do things to expedite that, to enhance it, to do EOD, something about which Dan Blank and I will be speaking later, that's all good. Okay, Nebraska is also an, an ethanol producer as well as being an oil producer, number two, 22 in petroleum, but number two in operating production for ethanol. So highly relevant there. Nebraska does need to diversify its economy. That goes without question. Uh, this offers an opportunity potentially to do that. Rural Nebraska is of particular concern. There's interest in and necessity of carbon capture and storage. I don't want to discuss this point in great detail. That's really for other people to talk about. But let's just stop and consider hazard and risk for a moment. We can think of CO2 as a hazard, uh, at least according to the vast bulk of scientific literature. Uh, the risk is in how we deal with it. And certainly we minimize risk by putting carbon dioxide that we generate into the ground into deep geologic storage rather than merely discharging more and more and more of it into the atmosphere. So moving along, talking about geology, if we step back and look at a geologic map of North America, we see some fairly complicated patterns, except for the interior of the continent where Nebraska is. And Nebraska is on the platform of the North American continent that's different from the two mountainous regions, one to the east, the Appalachian origin, one to the west, the Western Cordillera. Actually, another one to the south, a smaller one, the Wachita origin down in Arkansas and Oklahoma. But we're in the platform. What is the platform? Layers of sedimentary rock on top of the very old basement rocks that in the case of Nebraska, for the most part, came to be uh, between 1.6 and 1.83 billion years ago. Now, the North American continent itself is over 4 billion years old, but the number I just gave you, the range of numbers refers, refers merely to the rocks that we would encounter once we got through the pile of sedimentary rocks in drilling downward. Overall, geologic structure is gentle. And there's been no significant mountain building in Nebraska for a long, long, long time. These conditions really are ideal for the kind of carbon capture and storage we're talking about in this webinar. I'll remark that at least 87% of Nebraska is underlain by appreciable thicknesses of unconsolidated materials. That means less than 13% is bedrock at the surface. Uh, it's different even from Kansas. Why is that relevant to this webinar? Well, a lot of that unconsolidated geologic material, dune sands, uh, river sediments, et cetera, serves as the primary aquifers or hosts, the primary aquifers in Nebraska. So even though Nebraska is the groundwater state in many ways, those aquifers are way up near the top of the pile of geologic materials. And they're sequestered from the zones into which uh, we're discussing in placing carbon dioxide by hundreds, even thousands of feet of other strata that do provide a very effective uh, barrier there. So let's move in a little bit closer. There's Nebraska layer by layer, three layers represented here, one on top of the other. The surficial geology of which I spoke the sediments, the unconsolidated materials, the non-rock materials need the near the surface, some of which host the major aquifers in the state, 
Uh, they can be quite thick most places across the state. Um, the big yellow blob in the middle is the Nebraska Sand Hills, a big recharge area for the High Plains Aquifer, the single most important aquifer in Nebraska, and the aquifer over which 30% of the irrigated farmland in the United States is located. And what we're talking about for the most part in this webinar is well outside of the sand hills and well outside of that recharge area. Doesn't really matter that much anyway. We've got bedrock geology under that. That's the first rock that one would encounter in drilling down from the surface. Large area of Nebraska is sort of tan in color. Uh, those are the strata of the Ogallala group that in part host the High Plains Aquifer. Underneath that, we have plenty of other layers of sedimentary rock before we get down to basement geology. Those are the very old, very deep rocks. And as I stated earlier, under almost all of Nebraska, the basement rocks are between about 1.6 and 1.85 billion years old. Uh, they aren't really of much concern in this study. Geologic structure from a, a very broad viewpoint here, Nebraska is characterized by extremely gentle geologic structure, what we would call cratonic arches, like the Cambridge Arch, the Shadron Arch, the Suana Arch, and even a little bit of the Las Animas Arch, according to some, uh, some authorities uh, extending in from Colorado. These are very gentle upwarpings of those aforementioned sedimentary strata. These structures are beneath the unconsolidated surficial sediments of which I spoke. Uh, three main basins we see there, the denver julesburg Basin, major petroleum producing basin, the Kennedy Basin to the north, unknown by name to many people because it's relatively small, and the Salina or central Nebraska Basin to the east. Uh, one thing that's worth pointing in, a little bit, excuse me, down to the far southeast, a little bit of the Forest City Basin. FCB extends into Nebraska, and that's an area of interest for carbon storage as well, a petroleum producing area, and uh, maybe a little bit more discussion of that later on in the webinar. The Nemoha Tectonic Zone that you see there in southeastern Nebraska is in part an uplifted block of basement rock that comes within about 500 feet of the surface. And we're not talking about dealing with that at all. Nebraska is known for its groundwater. And my first thought to impart to you here is the most important aquifers way up at the top are all in those unconsolidated su surficial sediments and in the very uppermost layers of soft bedrock. So the High Plains Aquifer way up here in relatively young sediments and even some poorly consolidated sedimentary rocks of neogene age. Uh, those aquifers, which are so important to this state, are well, well, well above any of the strata that we're going to deal with potentially in terms of carbon storage. And they're isolated from it, from layers here, I'm running my cursor over them, that are shown in gray. Those gray layers are mostly aquitards. They don't transmit water. They don't transmit much of anything. There are a few thin aquifer zones within there, but they aren't really very important except in very, very localized parts of Nebraska that are really outside of our consideration in this webinar. I do wanna attract your attention to the, the part of the stratigraphic chart that says very little or no importance. Those aquifers are in very deep old rocks uh, some of that overlaps with what we're talking about for carbon storage uh, in, in this webinar, but you'll notice that those are colored in pink. So where there is water in those strata deep down below, they're secondary aquifers at best with very poor quality water. In fact, some of what we're talking about is brines. Lest you be worried, there are only about three dozen wells in the entire state of Nebraska that tap water from these depths, from this water that's high in total dissolved solids that you really wouldn't want to drink ever. 
And all of those wells are in eastern Nebraska in the Omaha area. And some of them were used, for example, for water to wash down the stockyards. So that's much different, I think we'd agree, from water that people would want to drink. Here's the area we're talking about in this webinar. The area in yellow includes places where there are ethanol plants, power plants uh, that, that are producing carbon dioxide and might be interested in sending that, some of that down into deep underground storage. Uh, that area does cross over some of the gentle geologic structures of which we uh, spoke earlier. Uh, that's not a concern though. In fact, to some degree, that structure of cratonic arches and sag basins, very gentle structures, is beneficial to the study because it does mean that some strata are bent downwards deeper into Earth's crust, therefore below the critical zone uh, that you're looking for to store carbon dioxide as a supercritical fluid. The Sleepy Hollow oil field is one of the places we've looked at in detail. It's shown there with a star. So if we, we look at the geology across this area, must, much of eastern Nebraska, where we do have a little bit of interest in bedrock aquifers, that's outside of the area of concern. Uh, the strata there uh, don't extend below that 2,600 uh, minimum depth contour on basement rocks for the supercritical storage. But if we get down to the central Nebraska basin and south and westward onto the Cambridge Arch along that transect AA prime, we, we are talking about strata in which we have some interest. I will draw your attention to the cross section across southern Nebraska shown below. The primary aquifers of which I spoke earlier are all up in the orange colored part of that cross section. They're way, way, way up at the top of the stack of geologic materials. The green zone in here represents Cretaceous strata, lots of shale, lots of chalky shale, a little bit of limestone, some chalky limestones and some chalks. Generally speaking, rocks that make a pretty effective seal, rocks that we consider from the standpoint of hydrogeology as aquitards, as barriers to the downward or for that matter upward movement of water. So if you think of the aquifers in Nebraska as a glass of water, the line between the green and the yellow there is the bottom of the glass. It holds the water in as it were and would effectively help hold in any carbon dioxide we pumped in to much deeper strata before that's below that supercritical line down here identified as strata of Pennsylvanian, Mississippian, and Ordovician age. You can also see the Cambridge Arch identified there, highly exaggerated because we've, we've compressed the horizontal scale and then stretched the vertical scale immensely. That's a very gentle structure. And the area just to the right of that would be that central Nebraska or Salina Basin where strata are bent downwards below that supercritical zone. Here's a look at uh, the, the oil field uh, down in southwestern Nebraska, Sleepy Hollow, in which we've done a lot of work. And uh, the first thing I'll draw your attention to is the stratigraphic column at the left that says measured depth, study area, stratigraphy. And the depths are in feet. And if you look here, you can see we have a stack of Cretaceous strata Dominantly shales with a little bit of limestone, a little bit of sandstone over the top. Spoke of those earlier. That's part of what, a little bit at least, of what serves as an aquitard, keeps the aquifer waters well above it. Uh, to that, we could even add some other Cretaceous strata as we go around Nebraska, including the Pier Shale, an extremely effective aquitard. Underneath that, we have strata of Permian and Pennsylvanian age. We were primarily interested in the Pennsylvanian strata, alternating limestones and shales chiefly, as a place where CO2 could be stored. Some of those units are oil bearing. Dan will talk more about that later. All of these strata uh, have waters that are high in total dissolved solids. These are not used as aquifers. 
they're well removed in terms of the vertical dimension from anything that is used as an aquifer. And I'll just point something out to you for your interest. In eastern Nebraska, 250 miles or so away from this area, where limestones are mined from the same succession of strata, underground mines go right through some of these limestone layers, and there's very little seepage of water into them. In fact, almost none at all. So that gives you sort of a seat of the pants illustration of how these strata really are separated from any overlying strata that service aquifers. We've studied some of these strata at a microscopic scale. This is a thin section of one of the layers of limestone, and we're looking at, at grains in there in the limestone, some of which are fossils. We're looking at the calcite cement that holds those together and binds them as a rock, and we're looking at the porosity in there as well. In this slide, very little porosity is evident. I think the reason why I show this slide is to indicate the lengths to which various parties have gone to accurately characterize the geology. So all the way from the microscopic scale to the scale of an entire county, nay, even the scale of an entire state, we've looked at issues. There's another limestone, uh, quite different. I think we'd all agree. I think I threw this one in just to show you the little fusilinids, F. Those are little microscopic organisms, believe it or not, single-celled, and they're sort of uh, tapered on both sides, they're cigar-shaped, and we're looking at them in cross-section. There's a little bit of porosity evident here, and those are the kinds of microscopic spaces into which that supercritical fluid CO2 might be stored. I was also asked to provide a little bit of perspective on the present project relative to my experience with the Keystone XL pipeline extension. Now, these are two different kinds of projects. Everyone can see that, transporting different kinds of materials, but there's so much more to the difference than that. And I'm going to get at that in just a moment. But I learned a lot from having to deal as a public employee with the ups and downs and ins and outs and various opinions regarding the Keystone XL pipeline extension. First one is the most important. They aren't stupid, stupid. Our fellow citizens are smarter than some authorities seem to think. Now, by some authorities, you might want to substitute college professors like me, because I learned people are pretty smart. However, there's a little bit of a corollary to that. Lots of people don't know enough about geology, and that's not their fault. That's the fault of the educational system. We should always be respectful of other people's viewpoints. It's warranted. It's required. But it also works wonders in terms of having a dialogue. We need to listen to the public. We need to learn. Uh, facts are our chief currency in all of this, and we've got lots of facts to back up arguments in this webinar and others associated with it. Others is part of the same series, but we need to exercise sensitivity and emotional literacy. I think everybody on this webinar is probably uh, level-headed and everything else, but occasionally we, we, uh, we get caught up in our emotions. So it is good to be aware of that. What's past is prologue. There can be long memories about controversial issues like the Keystone XL pipeline, we have to be aware of that and we have to work around it. We have to make sure we're bringing our message across very clearly. Uh, opposition can come from diverse section, sectors of the population, number four, and it might surprise you who might oppose or who might be for an initiative. Never underestimate people's resolve in that regard. I'll skip on to five well, we've got two fives. You people are lucky today. Normally, you don't get two fives, so five, five, and six. Let's skip ahead of those. Sometimes there are arguments presented uh, that are essentially logical fallacies. Uh, one logical fallacy is that if you stack up enough uh, weak facts, that that's an argument pro or con. And that's not true at all. All it takes is one really good argument. The nice thing about working on this project for me is that we, there are so many data 
there's so many good arguments uh, that I feel that there is no problem with a potential logical fallacy. But be prepared that there may be logical fallacies arguing against the kinds of things we're talking about here. The truth is always relative, but I want to skip on to the last point. I want to underscore I've learned over the years that even though the general public is not stupid, they're smart people. Most people don't understand much about geology. After all, it's not cute and cuddly. Uh, most people don't know that geology impacts their daily lives. So we always have a teaching moment in these things to communicate effectively and to get people to understand geology. And understanding geology is critical to underground carbon storage. And just as something to an addend, it offers an addendum on the Keystone XL pipeline. One of the things I've shown people in discussing the pipeline, just as food for thought, because I don't make arguments either pro or con, I can't as a public employee. There's the route of the Keystone XL pipeline extension, or at least what it was when it was proposed the second time. And here in red are all the existing pipelines of various kinds around the state of Nebraska. Most, I'll, I'll just observe, and you make out of it whatever you wish. Most people who attended uh, the, the sessions that, the, at which I spoke were completely unaware that there were this many pipelines in Nebraska, not to mention all over the interior, uh, all over the mid-continent, of the United States. They thought maybe they're all somewhere else. Perhaps it makes sense. Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, but uh, in Nebraska, there are quite a number of them. So sometimes uh, people need to be made aware of this kind of thing because it is context for what we might want to do. And I'm going to close with these thoughts. Remember, I'm a public employee. So I, I can't really offer an opinion pro or con. I can merely comment on my experience from having been a part of this initiative, been a part of this study. My first observation is they came to us. Battelle and partners sought us out as Nebraska's geological survey. We were involved, not involved. I apologize for the typographical error there from the start. And I think that's a really good sign. I think that's a sign uh, beyond the requirements and grant proposals that people were really interested in getting all the facts and getting them from a local level and developing partnerships. I think Battelle and others have covered the basis that have approached the project from many sides. I didn't sense this so much with the Keystone XL pipeline. They also have some highly qualified and experienced scientists who've worked on this, and uh, that has been apparent from the start. Also, it's a matter of apples and oranges. I didn't imply in any of this to make an absolutely direct comparison between the Keystone XL pipeline and the subject of this webinar. Uh, it is a starting point for considering uh, public opinion. It's a starting point for understanding sociological aspects of a potential project that's about the extent of it because we really are talking about apples and oranges well i hope i've been able to offer you some insights that are useful uh, i'll be available for questions later and if i can figure out how to stop sharing there we go i'll turn this back over to the conveners of the webinar thank you very much Thank you very much, Matt. And we'll we'll jump right over to Jared Hawkins with Battelle, uh, who is going to uh, go into some more detail about the geological research that was done as part of the Carbon Safe project. Am I unmuted now? Uh, you are unmuted. All right. Awesome. Um, so, uh, thank you, Brendan and, and Matt. Um, so my name is Jared Hawkins. I'm a research science energy division at Patel. And the uh, title of my presentation is uh, Lessons Learned from Geologic Investigations of the Integrated Mid-Continent Stack Carbon Storage Health Project. Um, I am a 
SCS hub. You'll see that acronym here and there. Um, and uh, my contact information is here too, just to let you know. Um, so a bit of what I'll be going over today, I'm going to get a little more in depth into exactly what we were doing in the um, in the IMSES hub con uh, project. Um, beginning with a little bit of project background, um, as well as the uh, geologic um, characterization efforts that, that we went through. Um, I'll focus on Nebraska since that's why everybody's here. Um, so I'll present some of the results that we have from the Sleepy Hollow oil field, which is in Red Willow County. Um, that's uh, 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 southwestern Nebraska, uh, right on the campus line as well as some results from the uh, Madrid, Nebraska site that we're considering. That one is uh, uh, pure ceiling storage, so uh, no potential oil to recover there necessarily. Um, that would be more of injecting directly into a saline aquifer. Um, finally, uh, we did a study of uh, the CO2 UR potential. Um, sorry, I'm just getting a message that my audio is cutting in and out. Um, I do not have a headset. Is is this any better? Hopefully. Okay. <laughs> I think I had my notebook in front of my uh, in front of my uh, microphone. I apologize for that. Um, uh, assuming you got most of that, hopefully, uh, I was at the CO2 UR potential in the study area. Um, so we, we did a study that um, uh, basically looked at oil field data and uh, figured out where we had uh, good CO2 UR potential um, in areas where we also had saline storage potential. Um, and then finally, uh, some conclusions from the uh, geologic investigation. So uh, moving into the, uh, the project itself, so um, to give you a little bit of background about um, the carbon safe project, it's a four phase uh, project. Uh, we're currently in phase two. The first phase was a, um, a pre-feasibility study. And uh, this current phase is a feasibility study. So um, going from pre-feasibility, it's basically, um, you know, whether or not you have any project at all. Um, and then the feasibility portion would be, um, kind of defining the, the boundaries of, of your system and, and getting a little more in depth into um, how exactly things will come together. Phase three uh, will be, um, well, phase three, if, if we had one, it would have been um, a uh, um, characterization. So we would have uh, dove a little more into the geology and uh, the, the potential there. Um, I should note as an aside that um, this research is, is still continuing um, in, in different forms, just not as the overall IMSCS hub contract uh, project. So um, um, obviously this is this is uh, still moving forward. Um, and then phase four would have been a construction of, of the, the project. Um, so the IMSCS hub was actually three phase one projects. Um, they're shown in this map here as blue dots. Um, the first was the uh, Sleepy Hollow oil field uh, in Red Willow County, um, SHF in the map. Um, the second is the was led by the Kansas Geological Survey, and it was at the Patterson Heinitz Heartland oil field. So that's in Western Kansas, PHH on the map. And the third was uh, led by the Energy and Environment Research Center, um, and that focused in Perkins and Chase County um, uh, in far western Nebraska. Um, so these were combined into uh, one phase two project, um, where basically what our idea was was to um, take the CO2 from um, ethanol plants, which have a low cost of uh, capture, I, I believe we went over that in the second webinar, um, combine it with the um, large uh, power plants in the, um, the source corridor that's shown on this map in yellow, and route the CO2 from that to the uh, storage corridor, which uh, is um, 
uh, I get messages from the audience and I feel like this is about as good as I can do. Uh, I apologize for that. Um, but uh, we're routing to the, the storage corridor in southwestern Nebraska and western Kansas. Um, and uh, there, there are the three areas here, the Madrid, the Sleepy Hill, and the Pat Patterson Hynek Redland site are, are sites that we focused in on. Um, the phase two uh, geologic characterization objectives. Um, so we were basically, our, our first order was to um, uh, combine and update our, um, our disparate, three disparate models from the phase one studies into a single model. So the map here shows uh, our, our entire regional storage corridor and uh, the, the, well, the black dots are the well data that basically um, fed into our models. So um, the, the first order was, was basically just uh, combining all of those and updating it with uh, the, the information that was available prior to the study. Once that was done, uh, the data collection plan that we developed as part of this phase was uh, tailored to address um, some of the data gaps that we found in those areas. Um, and uh, then that fed into our uh, characterization efforts, which during this project, we drilled three characterization wells, um, one in Sleepy Hollow, the Sleepy Hollow field, and two in the patterson Heinitz heartland field, um, and, uh, and uh, fully characterized those. We also took 3D seismic at the Patterson site and uh, um, updated our, our geologic models and reservoir models with, with this data. And finally, um, and I'll get into this a little later, we uh, evaluated the Madrid, Nebraska site for uh, saline storage. So, um, so uh, moving on to the, the Sleepy Hollow oil field, uh, the, um, we drilled the, the SHRU, it's Sleepy Hollow Reagan unit, 86A well in May and June of 2019. Um, so the, the, the well itself is basically right in the center of the field. Um, and the pink, so it's shown um, with the, the green line, the pink dots are the existing wells and the, the yellow is the outline of the oil field. Um, the targets uh, for, for this particular um, storage project would be these uh, Pennsylvanian units, the Wabansi, Shawnee, and Douglas, um, as well as the Lansing, Kansas City, Pleasanton, Marmonton, and Cherokee. Those are overlain by a, uh, a series of cap rocks um, that are uh, Permian age and, and some upper Pennsylvanian um, console grove and admire and uh, the Sumner and Nipawala groups. Um, and so we drilled the well and the, um, uh, we did some advanced characterization and interpretations um, to come up with uh, uh, basically um, uh, integrated um, lithology and geophysical and geomechanical core tests. Um, and uh, uh, as well as uh, some petrophysics uh, for both of our oil bearing and saline formations. These uh, feed directly into the uh, models we use to, um, to characterize the geology and predict the, the CO2 pressure, I'm sorry, CO2 plume limit and, and pressure um, increases. Um, and uh, we, we also did uh, baseline geochemistry um, of the formation fluids. And finally, we, um, as a note of the geology, we observed uh, Pennsylvanian cyclothems, which are alternating marine and non-marine formations. Um, and these led to uh, distinct stack storage targets. Um, and I'll get into it a little later as to why um, that is uh, an important observation. Um, so for the Sleepy Hollow oil field, uh, we actually found that the, uh, it did not satisfy the requirements of the uh, carbon safe project. Um, so uh, the carbon safe projects require 
50 metric tons of CO2 storage uh, within uh, 30 years. And uh, even with uh, um, 10 wells running, we could only get it to about 30 million metric tons. Um, and uh, the the reason for that was was just uh, uh, too much um, uh, too much um, the, the the reservoirs themselves weren't um, sufficient enough to to uh, store all of the CO2. Um, while it's not sufficient for a carbon safe scale project, um, it would be sufficient for a number of ethanol plants. Um, uh, just due to the fact that the, the CO2 emissions from those sources is, is generally much lower than um, uh, uh, what would be required to, um, to satisfy 50 million metric tons. Um, and also the CO2 EOR potential is, is, is pretty high in this oil field. Um, so that kind of led us to to refocus our efforts a little further to the northwest in Madrid. Um, so this is a, a few counties away from Red Willow. Um, and uh, basically, we found that this site offers um, 50 million metric tons of uh, storage potential in um, the Dakota formations, the Cedar Hill and the Cherokee which are uh, Cretaceous, Pennsylvania, and Permian here. We have the Lansing, Kansas City uh, as a uh, secondary uh, storage target. It's possible that it's a, a sufficient target, but we just don't have the well control. We don't have the data to, to confidently state that. The, uh, the three injection wells are, are shown in the map on the, the uh, top left. Um, so they're they're uh, actually located a, a bit north of of Madrid, and um, the uh, uh, um, the plumes are, are are shown in the the chart uh, that has the I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but the chart that has the the dates on it, um, so you can see the plumes propagate. We have thirty years of injection and uh, a 10 year period of, um, uh, of uh, post-injection monitoring. And uh, uh, finally, uh, just to, to give an idea of, of uh, the type of, of land use overlying the plumes, the map on the bottom left shows uh, the, the outline of the plumes in blue, and uh, uh, as well as the land use there. So um, brown is, is either pasture or Cropland and green is is undeveloped area, uh, grasslands usually, and uh, uh, so it avoids um, all you know urban areas and uh, um, also uh, sensitive features which are shown in, in the the darker greens and and uh, uh, oranges and, and red uh, there as well as as bodies of water for that matter. So. Um, Long story short, uh, we can fit the CO2 there, and it's uh, it's all generally in, in cropland and undeveloped areas. Um, finally, the, the the saline storage potential in the um, uh, Madrid site is actually uh, one of several potential projects that could be supported in the the um, the storage corridor. Um, so the the arrow here is pointing to the the Madrid site, uh, the star in, in the, the western part of Nebraska. Um, the green blobs here show the saline storage capacity per um, 10 square kilometers, and this is from a DOE reference, uh, it's the, the National Carbon Atlas or NatCarb, um, and basically the darker green, the more potential. So in that little star, we can fit, you know, 50 million metric tons. And then if you expand west into Nebraska, um, you have, you know, many million more tons that, that could potentially be fit there. Um, same um, for, for anyone interested in, in Kansas, uh, the, the same is, is possible um, in western Kansas. Um, and then, uh, so 
I, I've mentioned stack storage and CO2 UR a, a number of times already. And just to go through why we're interested in stack storage for CO2 UR, um, it's uh, so uh, essentially this, this figure here shows how you can inject CO2 into a reservoir to drive oil to existing or newly drilled production walls. Um, so when you're your reservoir is uh, is depleted and and under pressured. Um, your production is is has has um, plummeted. Um, you can use CO2 to in, inject and uh, and bring that pressure back up and basically force oil to to these wells. Um, some of that CO2 is produced and recycled. Um, however, uh, much of it is is um, stored um, it residually in, in poor spaces or uh, dissolved in immobile oil and gas. So not only do you have the benefit of um, additional oil production, but you also have the co-benefit of, of storage of CO2. And um, I took a look at uh, some, some numbers that uh, uh, have been published. The, so the the Clean Air Task Force um, suggests that um, about 0.3 tons of CO2 can be stored per barrel of um, oil produced, and that's uh, that's just kind of a general rule of thumb. Um, through market forces and and the additional CO2 that's that's uh, um, emitted as part of, of CO2 BWR, um is uh, uh 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 that that translates into being about 0.19 metric tons of storage uh versus or reduced co2 emitted versus uh, uh conventional production methods um we may actually have a bit better um uh, storage potential in the fields that we studied, uh, we found an average of about 0.39 tons of storage per barrel produced. So, um, you know, we'd, we'd need to do a, a, a bit more of uh, some accounting to, to figure out uh, exactly what that um, translates to as far as uh, comparing it to conventional methods, but, um, but it's possible that we would have um, an even better outcome. Um, so. I just got a message that we're running a bit over time, so I'm just going to kind of breeze through the rest of this. Uh, some advantages of, of our um, stack storage is uh, um, we have a smaller CO2 plume footprint. Um, there's an additional revenue source in the oil production, um, as well as an existing infrastructure and geologic understanding um, that, you know, people like Dan have spent a lot of time figuring out the geology of these reservoirs. So um, we benefit from that knowledge. Um, some challenges are our legacy boreholes can can uh, serve as uh, uh, points of CO2 leakage. However, if if everything is plugged and, and cemented and and constructed correctly, um, that risk can be greatly reduced. There are some contractual complications from you know who receives the CO2 and and when and what happens if uh, you know a, a source goes offline or whatever. But um, those uh, can be worked through. And finally, there are some monitoring issues from uh, injecting into multiple uh, storage formations. Um, this is, uh, I'll, I'll go through this really briefly. We, we did uh, stack storage potential and EUR potential of uh, 17 oil fields in the study area. Um, this was done largely by uh, uh, ARI, uh, Advanced Resources International, with, with um, us kind of leading the effort. Um, but uh, the fields specific to Nebraska that we studied are the Ackman, Sleepy Hollow, and Silver Creek. Um, anybody interested in this work, uh, feel free to email me and I can uh, get you a little more info. But uh, continuing on to conclusions. Um, so basically, um, the overarching goals that we accomplished in this are we identified the two commercial scale ceiling storage sites um, and our, our uh, Nebraska Kansas Storage Corridor, that, that being the Madrid and the Patterson sites, um, and then one uh, CO2 EUR project um, with some also some saline storage potential, although not at the carbon safe scale in southwestern Nebraska, that being the Sleepy Hollow oil field. 
Um, we also studied an additional 17 oil fields for stack storage potential. And uh, uh, a bit outside of what we did other than geology, um, you know, obviously we did some stakeholder outreach in, in these webinars, this webinar series. Um, we assessed integrated project risks and mitigation opportunities, um, provided a permitting plan um, specific to the mid-continent for integrated CCUS projects that covered everything from transporting uh, oversized loads to a full uh, class six um, underground injection control uh, um, uh, permitting process. Um, and then finally, we created a roadmap for how to implement um, the CCUS in the mid continent. And uh, uh, just to reiter reiterate this point, um, while the project was not se selected for phase three of carbon safe, um, the mid continent is a prime target for CCUS and the interest in projects has not waned. Um, so uh, thanks for listening. Uh, sorry about the audio issues. Um, and uh, I'll pass this to someone else somehow. Thanks a lot, Jared. And our, our, our next spirit, uh, speaker is Dan Blankenau with Great, Great Plains Energy. Dan is the president of Great Plains Energy. Uh, he's drilled more than 150 wells in southwest Nebraska and northwest Kansas and uh, has a, a, a long history in, in Nebraska as a, uh, in the oil industry and as a geologist. So, Dan, I believe you wanted us to share your slides. Is that right? Um, are they, I think I thought I could do it. Um, okay, give it a shot. Okay, I'll give it one quick shot. Sorry. Um, uh, and we can see it. Oh, you can see it. Okay. Yep, that's working fine. Okay, so I just need to go to the slideshow from the beginning. Yep. Wow. It perfect. Perfect for me. Well, hello everyone, and, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak with you from the oil patch. Uh, Great Plains Energy is very hopeful that CO2 can be delivered delivered to uh, oil fields in the region. Um, I'm going to give uh, some perspective from my experience with this project and relay some input from my numerous discussions over the years with my peers um, about um, CO2 and, and um, sequestration and what that might look like. I'm just going to briefly discuss some regional prospects for enhanced oil recovery and uh, address a little bit of how the oil industry um, perceives um, CO2 sequestration. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about issues that uh, we see from the patch, and then I'll briefly discuss um, stack storage and just a brief comment now on uh, um, public outreach. Okay, uh, you've all seen this picture numerous times, so I won't go into it too much, but uh, um, this is a region where we operate, and uh, you can see the regional production is located within the potential uh, pipeline corridor. Uh, for the most part, production is from the Lansing, Kansas City formations with some Cherokee and Reagan sand production within reach. Um, but I think the main prospects um, would likely be large fields that are currently under mature water flood in the Lansing, Kansas City. Um, and these fields are in great need um, of tertiary recovery methods. Um, additionally, there are numerous smaller fields that could be targeted for using CO2 as secondary recovery rather than waiting for tertiary recovery. There's hundreds of wells in the area. Um, however, there's not really a lot of uh, different operators out there, and we all get along for the most part, which is good. And uh, landowner relations is incredibly important to um, oil producers out here. And you know the industry is pretty well received in the area because you know it's, we've been around a long time and the uh, people in the area know oil. Um, producer perception of sequestration. I guess um, I'll maybe cut this a little shorter than I was thinking, but the, the industry partners that I've talked to are very enthusiastic. Um, as an industry, I would just summarize and say, you know, we'll take all you can get to us um, economically. Um, you know, we, we talk about the tertiary recovery need for the existing large fields, but another, you know, area of great intrigue um, is that some of these um, small fields 
could possibly go right from primary production to secondary production using CO2. And if that would be um, feasible, it would solve huge problems out there. And one of the biggest problems we have, of course, is fresh water. You know, fresh water is needed for flooding to a certain extent, and um, it is the most important resource in the area. There are tight restrictions on the quantity of fresh water used for industry. And if we could get by without using fresh water at all, that would be fantastic. Also, if uh, CO2 could even eliminate, you know, the use of highly saline caustic produced water from deeper zones for flooding, that would also be um, um, very beneficial. Um, I do not speak behalf, on behalf of the industry, but I can assert that I've only had positive feedback, um, you know, from, from my competitors and peers. Um, okay, here is a list of um, several topics that seem to be pervasive in discussions out there. Um, um, these are not the only issues, but they, they seem to be the main ones. And um, I do believe all of these issues have solutions. Number one, of course, is economics. You know, um, um, you know not a lot of infrastructure um, would need to be adjusted, but I feel the economic analysis that uh, was provided in webinar two it is reasonable. Um, the only thing that, uh, um, or I shouldn't say the only, but the main thing, of course, is the, the price of oil, which is a huge unknown always, and particularly now and going into the future. Um, let's see, I guess uh, um, reliability, reliability of the source, uh, it's, it's not clearly understood how consistent and reliable the source of CO2 would be if there you know, were to be a huge financial commitment to upgrade one of our facilities, you know, how, how are we assured, you know, that we, you know, won't get, uh, um, you know, that the source won't get a much better offer, you know, for their CO2. Um, another concern would have, would um, be that if the source for some reason was no longer a available to deliver the CO2 that um, we need or want. And of course, contracts would address these issues, but it's just something we've never dealt with before and we're interested in talking about. Um, in addition to the source rights, we are interested in, you know, the pipeline rights and what that might look like. Um, you know, would it be a situation where it's first come, first serve, or would it be based on volume? You know, basically, you know, the question is, questions are, you know, who gets the CO2, how much, and when. Um, poor space. Um, poor space seems to be relatively clear as to who has the rights. Um, the mineral owner owns the pore space, but we have questions occasionally from our lessors, you know, whether um, a particular um, um, gas, um, let's say helium, um, you know, what you know, what is it, or helium is, but I mean, what what is CO2 a mineral? That's what a lot of our very savvy lessors are gonna want to know, I'm sure. Um, and most of our leases are titled mineral leases. Um, so there may be some need to lease the CO2 separately on existing held, you know, per, um, HBP acreage, we call it, which is held by production. But the landowners typically are very eager to help us, you know, get more oil out of the ground. And so I don't think that would be a problem. Um, Offsite migration could be a um, very uh, um, interesting problem. The landowners seem to get along fine you know, with the oil companies out there, um, but they don't always get along with each other very well. And so I can see some potential issues um, that, that could occur. Um, you know, we'd have to be able to really verify, you know, mo verify the monitoring network, you know, to make sure that people are comfortable, you know, that oil's not leaving their property or CO2 is not impacting their property so that maybe it pushes oil away from them. Um, it's it's not common, but it's it's uh, it's theoretically possible as it's happened with water flood portions of secondary recovery. Um, from a regulatory standpoint, um, the NOGCC and the NDEE are you know fabulous to work with. You know, I don't think it's going to be an issue. You know, we would want to look out for you know potential conflicting regulations, but I I don't see that on the horizon. Um, Long-term monitoring and liability, of course, we'll always be worried about that. Um, you know, the post-injection site care seems kind of daunting, um, but I imagine that 
if this goes forward, we'll be introducing, you know, um, institutional controls that could handle that. Um, unitization um, is actually fairly simple in Nebraska and uh, compared to other states, um, but, and the operators typically get along pretty well. So if there's, you know, commingling of leases in a unit, um, I, I believe that those issues can be worked out. I feel we probably will have to expand a unit boundary in order to um, accommodate any offsite migration, but I don't think that's um, um, insurmountable. Um, partnerships, um, you know, I, I feel partnerships are not, I mean, are just absolutely essential, I think, to make this happen out there. Um, you know, I, I have no real idea how it would look, but we would certainly like to talk to people about that. I, I mean, you know, is it a matter of sharing credits and enhanced production? Uh, or one or both or separating you know, the two somehow. Um, one of the biggest issues I think would be, you know, how we assure the mineral owners are adequately uh, taken care of. Um, you know, the partnership model would probably be based somewhat on incremental barrels and uh, we have to make sure that the um, current mineral owners and landowners are, are happy with that. Um, <laughs> Thing that, uh, that I think about when I think about partnerships, you know, it may take years to build a pipeline, but it also seems like trucking is feasible. So maybe a partnership could um, be put in place that would generate incremental bar barrels that could help fund or pay down for infrastructure on a on a project. And then finally, um, uh, marketing um, for our industry, I, I feel there's a real potential for um, greening up our oil, you know, in a, in a legitimate fashion, you know, in Nebraska. I mean, we don't frack in Southwest Nebraska. Ethanol is a green energy, you know, which does need hydrocarbons for the time being anyway, and so carbon sequestration combined with oil and ethanol, it could be very well received by the public, which is a very, very big um, um, issue is the public and an and a important one, as Matt was saying. Well, th these are just some quick issues that we've come up with, um, you know, specific areas of concern. But as I've said, I, I really believe um, they are all um, solvable. Um, a brief comment on stack storage. If, if I had my way, I would almost insist on a stack storage project, you know, just from a management and maintenance standpoint. I can see, you know, if we have a project in the region and maybe a contract for a specific of CO2 to be injected and um, then shut down for maintenance or, or, or some reason that saline injection would be just a, a very um, um, neat way of, uh, of, of taking that CO2 while we're working on a, on a well. Um, you know, and there's also the concern of um, that if the infrastructure is already in place for a CO2 EOR project, and let's say the field depletes faster than the modeling predicted, which can happen, um, you know, perhaps the system could be, you know, um, morphed into a um, saline storage only project or something like that, which would also help address some of the long term um, uh, liability and monitoring issues that we have. And then um, finally, um, you know, public outreach, you know, education, education, education. I think my industry does a poor job of education. You know, as Matt discussed, you know, there are very emotional views on oil production infrastructure in Nebraska and legitimately so because we've done a poor job of, um, of um, educating the public. And I could go on for that if you would give me another four hours. I think I'll wrap that part of my talk up. And uh, thank you very much.